I'm here today with uh, some of the staff from North Middle School, Beth Beecher, who is our student support advocate, and Shannon Frazier, who is one of our counselors at North Middle School. And I asked them to make a quick video with me just to start a conversation around student mental health uh, with our families. So thanks guys for joining us. Um, and I just, I wanna start with just a little bit of background information about why this topic is so important. And then if you don't mind, I, ha I have some questions for you. Um, so I just wanna start with um, our objectives kind of with this video or just to talk a little bit about uh, the current challenges and how this might be impacting mental health. And then look at identifying some ways to support our kids during this time. And then some warning signs that we might share with parents around knowing when to, when to be concerned and maybe when to seek out some help. Um, so one thing we do know is that um, almost 30% of parents are experiencing negative mood and poor sleep quality with 122% increase in reported work disruption and 86% of families are experiencing hardships such as a loss of income, a job loss, caregiving burdens, and household illness. And Families are experienced also reporting negativity, negativity in their child's disruptive or uncooperative behavior at home. Um, so I wanted us to take that time to understand kind of where that's coming from and the challenges for them behind it. Um, and from the Department of Health, we know that some of the things that we might notice in our kids and our families is anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. This idea of pandemic apathy where we're just exhausted with this right now and for kids that can look kind of two ways that it might be acting out and refusing to follow any of those directions or it might look like acting in where they're avoiding things like friends or taking care of their hygiene or going to school or really engaging in ways like that. Um, kind of just a general exhaustion, cognitive disruption, um, and then sometimes substance use or abuse. So I'm sure at the school level, you guys are hearing and seeing that too. So that's kind of where I want to start with some of those challenges and just ask you more what you're seeing at school. So um, just to start with, can we talk about what is typical and what can we expect during a, a pandemic in this extra time of stress? Well, I think we can all agree that um, we, it, a pandemic is something very different than anybody has experienced. So we, most of us haven't experienced anything like this. So definitely we're gonna say weirdness, any sort of weirdness is gonna happen. So like changes in routines and patterns, uh, naturally sleep patterns are probably gonna look a little different. It's kind of like on the weekends when we sleep in a little bit more or during the summertime, we uh, sleep in a little bit more and we stay up a little bit later. So things like that are, are pretty typical with something like this. It's breaking up our routine. So um, moodiness, also like a feeling of mixture of emotions, like it's gonna be all across the spectrum probably. A lot of isolation um, and it's also a lot of togetherness time. So you're isolated from others, but you're together with your family a lot. And then uh, changes in appearance within reason. So a lot of us are kind of bored and we might find us in front of the mirror, maybe doing a little change in our appearance. And that's pretty normal. Um, but you want to kind of kind of make sure that you're noticing and keeping track what's within reason. And then changes in friends and socialization patterns. Their, their world's been a little bit turned over, so they are definitely going to change how they're interacting with friends. They might not be friends with the same friends that they were before, just because the access to friends is different. Um, we also want to point out that there's a lack of responses from your kids oftentimes. So like when you ask them, what's wrong? What's going on? They might not even know, so they might say like, I don't know, and that's okay because it's it's hard to pinpoint emotions sometimes. So that's all totally developmentally appropriate. Hmm. Um, and I imagine that it's not just the kids that you're seeing this with. I expect that there's lots of typical challenges for families in our community right now. Yeah, definitely. Families are struggling with a lot of the same things their adolescents are. 
Um, I think there's just an overall increase in stress, which you mentioned on an earlier slide due to changes in resources, you know, income, food, basic needs. Um, you might have family members that are struggling with COVID or a loss of a loved one. So a lot of grief and loss as well. Um, you can also see an increase in responsibilities regarding childcare, which stresses out the adults or other siblings in the home outside of the adolescents. So just to keep in mind that your whole family is experiencing a shift in their routines and a shift in their norms. That's really important. Um, that isolation you might see with your middle schoolers, high schoolers, parents feel that too, that fatigue of all the togetherness. Um, as adults in the home, you're not getting the regular breaks that are built into parenting and being able to send your kids to their friend's house or aunties or cousins or grandmas or daycare or <laughs> school. So um, adults are feeling that um, apathy and that fatigue of all the togetherness time. And also everybody, not just your adolescents, are probably going to exhibit signs of irritability. <laughs> so um, shorter fuses with the adults, with toddler, anywhere from toddlers up to teenagers and the adults in your home are all feeling the stress of changes and routines. So I think families need to be kind to themselves because everybody's struggling, not just the kids. Yeah, for sure. Are there any kind of, if, if you had some, some things that we could do at home, what would be kind of the top of your list recommendations? At home. So there's some recommendations and some other, we hear some concerns too, but the recommendations at home for the adults and, you know, any adult that's in your home, it doesn't just have to be the caregiver, would be to model self-care, to take care of yourself, um, take breaks, whatever, if it's taking a warm bath, reading a book, taking a walk, practicing some sort of self-care routine, trying to keep your structure in your home predictable. So having predictable routines, having rules in place that everybody follows, supporting healthy, safe social interactions for your kids and for the adults in the home. Um, monitoring all of your kids' social media content is always very helpful. You can catch triggers and warning signs at that point. Um, practice flexibility. You know, we all have to change and understand that things can be different day to day in our homes. And then developing a sense of purpose for your family during this time and focusing on hope. This will end. At some point, this will end. Will life be exactly like it was before? Maybe not, but we will be back in school at some point in time and kids will be able to hang out and socialize. So focusing on it being temporary, I think is important as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, are there, what would you say are some signs that we might look for that might signal more of a concern? So like maybe some things that you might be hearing, is that what you're, sorry, is that what you're asking? Yeah, just like, how would a parent know? I mean, we're, you're telling us that a lot of this is typical and we should expect a lot more of this, but how would we know when it's time to seek support, when it's bigger than something I might be able to manage and I should be more concerned and I should reach out for some extra help for my child? Beth, I think this one was yours, oh. Joy. Yeah, so I think we skipped one. That's why we're thrown off. <laughs> <laughs> you're keeping um, us on our toes. <laughs> oh, um, sorry. No, it's okay. So there are some big things you can recognize with your adolescents. These might exist for elementary school kids as well, but distinct changes in hygiene and self-care are really important. So if you have a student who prided themselves on their appearance and now they're not bathing or showering, that can be a warning sign that there's something bigger going on. I mean, I think we've all had a change in how you know, maybe we've abandoned jeans and dress pants, but looking beyond that into things that are um, atypical for your student. I think definitely, Shannon would agree, any talk or mention of suicide or self-harm from your students, and that includes on their social media pages. So anything um, talking about not wanting to be around anymore, I don't wanna be here anymore, 
I'm thinking of ending it. Those are all very clear warning signs that something bigger is happening and that some um, help should be sought out. I think significant, and when I say significant, we're talking about changes that are lasting weeks, even months, um, not just a day or two, but significant changes in eating patterns. So if your student has stopped eating or is eating everything all the time and can never be satiated, that would be concerning and you might wanna reach out for help. Um, any significant changes to sleep? That's not, I'm sleeping in an extra hour or two or I'm staying up an extra hour or two. That's not feeling like you're ever well rested or not sleeping at all. So if your student is struggling with insomnia, something like that would be worrisome. Also significant risk-taking behaviors. Kristen, you mentioned them earlier, but um, you know, if your student's running away, drug or alcohol use, um, significant unhealthy coping skills, um, resorting to violence, anything like that. Those are the big kind of red flags that we want parents to keep an eye out for that would really indicate that there is some need for professional help. That's really helpful. Um, are there some of those that you are, are those concerns that you're hearing from your students and in our community right now? So a lot of concerns that we're hearing um, from parents are things like, my kids are always on social media or they're always on the computer, um, or I don't know what my kid is doing all day. And that might just be because either they're at work and they, they don't have anyone with their child um, that's kind of monitoring their teenager, or um, they maybe they just don't wanna hover over their shoulder all day and they wanna give them a little space, or they might be working from home too. And maybe it's not something that they can monitor really closely what their kid is doing. So it's kind of like a um, feeling really um, out of control because you just don't know what maybe your kid is tapped into all day. And then um, I can't be with them all the time. Like I said, just the same, you can't just hover over their shoulder all day long, depending on the age level of the child. And then um, also a lot of the concerns that we're hearing is that parents are saying that they're afraid their kid is falling behind in school. And so it's a, it's a common concern, but just remembering that we're all kind of in it together. So, I mean, you know, we're all struggling through this together. And then also um, a concern we have um, been hearing quite a bit is that kids aren't getting a chance to socialize. So that's a big concern that parents have. They feel like their kids are lonely or they just are kind of out of touch with other kids and just um, kind of a longing to help their kid actually interact with other kids. So that sounds like a really difficult balance to find then where you, you know, between work and your kids are home all day and there's that struggle to monitor them at the same time you want to be aware and noticing these things that Beth was just mentioning to know if it's a bigger concern. If, if I have this concern that I'm not sure what's going on or, I, you know, they're not talking to me as much as they used to or we're, we're separated a lot because of work and all of those dynamics. What would you suggest are kind of some next steps to just um, try and get a better understanding of what the concerns are, or what I might want to do next? So, oh, I think Shannon's got the first one and then we'll kind of go into some specifics. Okay. Sorry, I'm That's also right. multitasking at home here. So um, the first thing that you would want to do is um, contact your school counselor. So we're here, we're working from home too, a lot of us, um, some of us are on site, but I mean, you, we're always here to help and we are willing to help. We have a lot of different resources that we can help um, guide or steer you, steer you towards. We also do um, trainings and stuff, you know, different trainings we offer through ParentLink. So that's um, something that we put on. We call in experts from the community and we try and um, connect those experts with parents. So um, we do offer those a couple times throughout the year. So always look for a parent link session. Those can usually be pretty helpful. And then a uh, pediatrician is always a really good um, safe first step to just tap into the pediatrician for re referrals and advice. I think the other thing you can do is even though your students might not be responding to you, is try and talk openly to them. 
let them know what your concerns are, gather some information about what they're feeling or what their perceptions are. Because as parents um, or guardians, we worry constantly. <laughs> so we wanna check in with our kids to see if our perception might be off. Um, and really remembering to avoid shaming and blaming them. This is hard for everybody. And so a lot of these things are outside of their control. Um, letting kids know that you're worried about them and you want to help um, is really important. And acknowledging that sometimes parents, you know, I have teenagers of my own, we don't always have the answers. And so giving them the heads up that you're going to reach out to professionals for support is important. You don't want to blindside your kids by scheduling appointments for them and not telling them what they're for. So open lines of communication between you and them is really important. If you are wanting to reach out directly to mental health providers, you can do that too. If you have private insurance, you can contact your insurance provider and they can provide you with a list of referrals of therapists or groups that take your insurance. You can also get online and access Psychology Today is a great website and we'll show you the link and what it looks like for you to find um, providers for mental health that take your insurance and might have openings. If you have state insurance, there are local group mental health providers that take state insurance. There's three in Everett, Compass Health, CMAR, and Catholic Community Services. Or you can also contact, like Shannon said, you can contact your pediatrician who can give you a referral. But if you know that you want to access mental health, your school counselors, your family support advocates, your student support advocates at school can help you with those referrals and speeding up that process. That's really helpful. Thank you. So yeah, so we did put together a, just a couple more slides. Um, let me pull those up here. To, um, the, again, the, the tips of what to do at home, and I'm, I won't read through these. I'm just going to go kind of slowly so that if anybody wants to take a picture or be able to pause, you can kind of flip through. Um, and some of those tips that we, or resources that we talked about, there's a lot of different crisis support lines. Um, some of these are more national lines, but also some local, local contact numbers there. Um, some at-home activities, our social emotional curriculum for, at our schools is second step, and they have a series of um, acti activities that you can do at home that are simple, all the way to some uh, more videos around parent self-care and co having conversations with your teenagers. Um, and then again, you talked about those other, uh, the Psychology Today and NAMI, and then um, some other uh, behavioral health toolbox. Did you guys, do you want to touch on any of this now, or do you want me to flip through to the, the bigger slides? I think it's important for parents and guardians to know that the crisis support is stuff that you can access as a parent or a guardian, but also that your teenagers or adolescents can access. So um, we, at working at North Middle School, refer our kids to the texting crisis line frequently because they're comfortable texting and they don't want to talk on a phone. So making sure that if you have a student that's struggling, maybe have this posted somewhere around so that and have a conversation about what they're for and your kids can access it. While that might make us uncomfortable as parents, we don't know it's still giving them the opportunities to reach out for help themselves. We want them to advocate for themselves too. So maybe even showing your kids this whole video. They, so they know what to look for and they know what to do. You know, starting in sixth grade, they can reach out to their school counselors too if they're struggling. So we want the support to come from all around. Yeah, thank you. That, that's important. Ultimately, we just want them to have the help, right? Whether it's through us or they access it on their own, we just want them to ha have that resource. Um, so here's, um, just pause here with the, the Psychology Today therapist search with the web address. Um, and this is what the website will look like when you get there. And that's for private insurance, right? That will help somebody with their own private insurance find a therapist. Correct. And it's really great because once you get into it, once you put in where you live at, you can sort by therapists who take your insurance and therapists that see children and adolescents. Or if you're looking for a therapist yourself as an adult, you can sort by that as well. So it's a really neat tool. I suggest you go around and go in and play around with it. Um, and a lot of the therapists update whether they're taking new clients or not. Great. 
Um, the next one I have here is the Volunteers of America Crisis Line for Snohomish County. And it looks like when I see this that they have a chat now, so there's kind of that instant help that the kids could access on their own or that parents can access support right away. Um, and then NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Health, they also have some resources that you can connect with, um, with people right away or education classes or parent support groups in our community. Um, and then this is one of the second step resources that just is a, a bank of uh, videos around having those conversations. So it shares some real parents, real students, um, and their thoughts around having these, some of these things you were talking about, Shannon, around um, is it too much screen time or their independence right now or how they're communi communicating. So there's some really interesting videos here to just help you think about having those conversations. And then um, for our little ones, kind of down to kindergarten through 12th grade, there's some, you know, just kind of supplemental activities to that you can do at home on that website at secondstep.org also. Um, that's all. So thank you guys so much for joining and um, engaging in this conversation. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you.